Shalom. I'm really excited about sharing something of my story with you today. I'm one of many exiles who grew up in Babylon, forcibly removed from our land. We spent 70 years under the reign of our oppressors. And this is my story. You see, the dream of going back home was a luxury, not to be indulged in too frequently. <laughs> my mind's excursions into the past made it difficult to live in the present. You see, life had radically changed for me and for my family. My parents had the hardest adjustments. The exile to Babylon brought such pain, yet the remembrances of life back in Jerusalem were told with such joy and passion. And they were retold so often that I actually began to believe that they were my stories. When they spoke about their lives and the festivals, as a child, I remember closing my eyes and imagining the singing, seeing the tables filled with food, family and friends gathered in our homes. But their voices changed when they recall those early days in exile, when the familiar rhythms were replaced with much different sights, sounds, and smells. I would often catch my mom and dad in their later years staring out at nothing with tears welling up in their eyes. They would quickly wipe them away, but I would remember in those moments they would sit down and encourage us with words from the prophet Isaiah. Uh, no, 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 not Isaiah, Jeremiah. They would remind us of Jeremiah's words that he shared with them many years ago where he said, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses, settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because it pro if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You see, as a family, we were forced to start our lives completely over. A new country, new home, new friends, new employment. We're called to raise children, grandchildren in the midst of foreign customs, languages, traditions. All of this was done under the dark clouds of ridicule and suspicion and hostility. It was hard for my parents. But you know, when I lost them, it seemed like a door to the past was forever closed. So when news came that we were free to return to our homeland, I refused to accept it not wanting to be disappointed. It was almost too much to allow myself to even imagine the possibility. Yet it was true. Many chose to stay behind. For them, the adjustments were too much to embrace. After all, we were no longer young men, 
born in exile, we spent our formative years with stories of the past and <laughs> never experiencing it for ourselves. However, the thought of being buried in a foreign land, far from my ancestors and all that I had come to cherish, well, that was all the inducement I needed to embrace the opportunity to return. And you know, when I returned, whatever I imagined finding upon my return to Jerusalem, it proved to be far worse. Time did not look with favor on the landscape. The city of Jerusalem bore the scars of past aggression. Its walls were toppled over, the city gates were burned, the temple destroyed, barely giving a hint of its former glory. The inhabitants in the city of Jerusalem had no compassion for our return. We were viewed with suspicion, seen as a nuisance, a distraction, a people giving voice to an inconvenient dream that would never come to pass. You see, in those early days, I found myself weeping often. I was trying to reconcile in my mind the numerous stories I had heard over the years. Stories that recall the faith of our fathers. And then I tried to reconcile with the stories of the faithlessness of Israel and its devastating consequences on the city of Jerusalem. I tried to reconcile the stories of the compassion of the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, with the stories of the exploits of Babylon's king, Nebuchadnezzar. So here I stood, an old man with old memories, looking for a way to console my heart with the hope of a very different future. Now, don't get me wrong, even though I was glad to be back in our land, our future looked bleak, far beyond our ability to remedy. Yeah, can I be honest with you for a moment? Because I recall in those moments thinking that perhaps all this happened so that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. <laughs> you can imagine, well, Maybe you can't imagine what it was like to be a witness to a work that only God can do. And it began without me even being aware. It, it began in fulfillment of the word that God spoke to Jeremiah. We didn't know it at the time, but God had been moving the heart of Cyrus, the king of Persia, who had defeated Babylon making our return even possible. God opened the, the, the heart of Cyrus, and Cyrus issued this proclamation throughout his kingdom. He even put it in writing. You know what the king of Persia would say? He would say, let the temple be rebuilt as a place to present sacrifices, and let its foundations be laid. The costs are to be paid by the royal treasury and the gold and silver articles of the house of God, which the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, took from the temple in Jerusalem and brought to Babylon, were there to be returned to their places in the temple in Jerusalem. They are to be deposited in the house of God. Now, wait a minute. Did you catch that? God opened the heart of Cyrus, but he did more than that. He opened up his treasury. He even opened up the trophy cases of these foreign gods and took the articles that were part of our worship in the temple and gave them back. You know, once the returning exiles settled in their towns, despite their fear of the peoples around them, they did build the altar on its foundation and they began to sacrifice offerings to the Lord. And it wasn't long after that that they began to work on the foundation of the temple of the Lord. 
so that when the builders laid the foundation and the temple of the Lord, it was a time when all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundations of the house of the Lord were laid. But as we were told, on that day, many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple, well, they wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid. While many others, much younger, they shouted for joy. No one could, could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. You know, also despite the delay in the temple construction due to opposition and setbacks, the people persevered. And in time, a new temple was dedicated. See, a number of years would pass and a new king would reign in Persia. His name was Artaxerxes. And in his seventh year as king, that's when Ezra arrived in Jerusalem. Ezra, well, he found favor with God and the king. You know, Ezra was a priest from the line of Aaron, a priest who had devoted himself to the study and observance of the word of God and to teaching its decrees and laws to the people of Israel. Ezra began his ministry in earnest. And during this time, spiritual renewal began to transform Jerusalem. And I know this because it was during this time that I found my way to Jerusalem. It was during this time when Ezra was teaching and preaching that I found myself being drawn back to Jerusalem. And I could tell you of the effect that it had on all the people. Lives were being transformed. The hearts of the people, once so far away from the things of God, were now open and receptive. And while some things were changing, ah, there were still the daily reminders that all was not well. The wall of Jerusalem was still broken down. Its gates were still burned with fire. All a vivid reminder of our past. But God, once again, did what we never fathomed could happen. Fourteen years later, he would send Nehemiah. And Nehemiah came and he rebuilt the wall. At great emotional cost, Nehemiah persevered. He withstood criticism from outside the camp and from within. He skillfully maneuvered plots to delay. Well, listen, we all worked hard, but the day arrived when the wall was complete and the gates were rebuilt and hung. Signs of hope were all around us. When all our enemies heard this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and they lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Can I tell you of one day in particular that stands out to me? That's part of this story that I want to share with you. It was a day when all the people assembled as one in the square. We had told Ezra, the scribe, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the very first day of the seventh month of that year, I'll never forget it, Ezra the priest brought the law, the Torah, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. And before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon. You see, he did all this in the presence of men and women and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively as Ezra read from the book of the law. You know, Ezra he stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. And when he opened the book, all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, 
the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, me among them, amen, amen, we cried out. And then we bowed down and worshiped the Lord with our faces to the ground. You know, the Levites, they began to mingle among the group and they instructed the people while we were all standing there. They read from the book of the law, making it clear and giving the meaning so that we could understand what was being read. And then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest and scribe, and all the Levites who were instructing the people, they reminded us that this day is sacred to the Lord your God. That we were not to mourn or weep because all the people had been weeping as we were listening to the words of the law being read. Nehemiah, I remember him saying, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. The day is sacred to our God. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. You know, the very next day, the heads of all the families, along with the priests, the Levites, they gathered around Ezra, and they were giving attention to his reading of the scriptures again. And they found written in the law, in the book of Leviticus, where God commanded through Moses that the Israelites were to live in booths, tabernacles, tents. And um, they would proclaim by this action to the world an experience they had as they wandered through that wilderness. Everyone throughout the towns of Jerusalem heard this word. And so you know what happened? We all went out and bought, brought back branches and built ourselves these tabernacles. We put them on our roofs. We put them in the courtyards, in the, in the courts of the house of God, in the square, wherever we could find room. And the whole company had returned from exile. We built booths and lived in them. We were told that from the days of Joshua until that day, Israel had not celebrated it like this. Their joy was very great. You know, when I think back on that story, that celebration of the Feast of Booths, I remember it with such fond memories. It was such a good time. You see, for us, returning exile, this festival particularly meaningful because we had experienced ourselves an exodus. Only it wasn't from Egypt. This time it was from Babylon. See, what God did in the days of Moses, many, many, many generations ago, was repeated in our day. In the days of Moses, as the Israelites passed through the desert, living in booths, God fed them with manna from heaven. He gave them water to drink, sustaining them even when they had rebelled, providing them direction with his word. God sustained them and he brought them home. The Feast of Booths was a reminder of God's watch care and provision. It was a way for us to reflect on God's glory and goodness, on the strength of his promises. You know, the Levites that day, they helped us to bridge the last 70 years in Babylon with the promise of God's word. And it wasn't easy. You know, although God's word provides power for life and faith, it takes hard work to understand this message of God, which to us, by the way, being brought up in Babylon, with a different language, different customs. It was as foreign to us. And we needed the Levites to interpret, translate this word of God so that we would understand it. Because it spoke about a different time, a different place. 
But now we were back. And this feast of booths it was reminding us of a God who doesn't change. What he did for the Israelites, he did for us. You see, the word had a profound effect on us. It brought tears. It brought grief. But it also brought a recognition. Not only that our ways may have displeased God. But it also brought grace. Which is the best response to those exhibiting repentance. So here we stood. Enjoying life, eating choice food, drinking sweet drinks. God is good. You know, I look back. Growing up. So far removed. From this experience. And now experiencing as if it was all new. You know, we opened our hearts to make room for the word of God. We opened our minds and hearts. And it brought life to our damaged soul. We, we manifested a desire to really understand God and his ways. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the instruction that gives new life. It changed me. You know, without good teachers, the book, even when you possess it, it still can remain a closed book. I came to fully appreciate the importance, though, of those public assemblies, not only for instruction and worship, but I'm telling you, it had a lasting impact on us and our children. And it fueled the, fly, the fires of renewal. And the results were seen by all. You know, everything changes when your desire changes. We now had a desire to learn, to surrender our heart to the power of this truth. And the result? The joy of the Lord became our strength. Now, I want to thank you for listening to my story. But it's really God's story. It's God's story that shaped my story. It's God's story that brings great joy. And I'm certain it can do the same for you.